All right. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's uh, my honor to uh, start uh, this uh, session on uh, next generation uh, energy performance certificates. Uh, so I will uh, present you shortly at the beginning of the program and uh, the way uh, we would like to work on, uh, on during this session. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, this project uh, we have, has received funding from the uh, European Union Region 2020 research. Uh, but as uh, you understand, this document represents the author's view and uh, the uh, panelist uh, views. Uh, we will first have a presentation uh, with Paul Garcia. I will not introduce every speaker. I will leave them uh, the possibility to do it uh, at the time. They will uh, have the floor to make their presentations. Uh, we will then have a presentation with Marianne Geola Fabri, which she's working at BPI. Uh, then uh, a, a round table uh, with three panelists, uh, Stefana Thomas, uh, Andre Litiu, and uh, Ina Maya. Further on, uh, four panelists, Panagiotta, Hatsi Pinakiotto, Mikhail Pomianovsky, Maria Bonetta, Olivier Grelou. Uh, and uh, we will uh, close with this session with Maria Herando, Peter Juris, Alexander Terianis, and Alvaro Sicilia. And the closing say remarks with uh, Miss Marilor falk -Masse, uh, who is the Vice President of uh, FEDAREN. Uh, so this will be the program for the uh, next uh, hour and a half. Uh, but as an introduction, uh, I would like to take uh, the possibility uh, to introduce what we are uh, doing uh, with uh, the uh, RIVA uh, Federation uh, uh, in, in these uh, uh, activities and uh, what uh, our involvement in this program is and how we are very pleased and very uh, honored to the possibility to participate to this uh, uh, knowledge sharing and uh, and uh, thinking about what could be the next generation of uh, energy performance certificates. Well, you, you know very well the key recommendation from the uh, EPBD. Uh, what uh, will be very important, I think, to, is the capacity that we will have to work on a systemic approach and uh, with multifactorial approach, because it's clear that uh, we have to focus on energy efficiency and energy performance. We have to integrate it into the new buildings and uh, into the renovation. But uh, we also think that it's a clear uh, vision that we put two buildings to put people in, and we have to think about uh, and to take into account the uh, indoor environmental quality of buildings, the impact on uh, energy uh, power, which is linked to the uh, smart readiness indicator. And all that needs to be linked also to what the financial uh, side uh, expect from us. And especially with the work conducted by what we call the taxonomy, uh, where we will have clear uh, vision about what is expected from the investors and banking side in order to combine this uh, uh, performance uh, information that needs to be uh, linked to, you know, to finance. As you know, uh, we work and we would like really to work with this uh, 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 European norms linked to indoor quality uh, performance, the European norm uh, 16798 slash one, uh, because it's clearly here that we are going to strengthen the credibility of our approach in terms of energy if it's really linked to what the people uh, uh, would expect in terms of comfort and, uh, uh, and health uh, quality inside the building. I already mentioned the taxonomy and the smart readiness uh, indicator for electricity power. Uh, we have worked uh, previously on a system performance called the Aldrain Tail Indicator to rate indoor environmental quality, linked to Aldrain Project, where we have worked since a couple of years on this uh, voluntary certification scheme based on European norms and that can be applied uh, all European around. So you will find a lot more details and resources 
on our website, on your active website, on the European Union. So don't uh, uh, don't hesitate to take uh, information, of course, uh, in the Builder port in Builder portal also. And you also will have a possibility, if you wish, to uh, link to this uh, Riva Web Knowledge Hub, where you will find a lot of work. But uh, about what I mentioned in terms of uh, Aldrain tail indicators, Aldrain project, and the work we have done on smart readiness indicator. So I will uh, close here for the introduction and uh, the, uh, how we see uh, how we need to work uh, with uh, more uh, people and linked everything uh, in, a, in a systematic way and with a holistic approach. And you, uh, I will then give the floor to uh, Paul Garcia Audi. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, uh, to have accepted to be uh, one of our, our panelists today. Uh, and you will give us uh, a first uh, uh, presentation about uh, uh, what uh, you are working on based on uh, the EPBD uh, revision. Uh, linked to uh, this uh, package Fit for 55. Paul? Yes, I'm connecting. Well, connecting, I'm, I'm waiting for okay. the screen to come up. Can you see my screen now? And can you yes. see the presentation? We, we see uh, we see your slide deck, yeah. Okay, perfect. I'm, I'm making it now if full you, screen. If yeah, perfect, yeah. Okay, well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us uh, here today. It is um, there. These are busy times for us because we are working very hard on the um, on the revision of the EPBD. Uh, unfortunately, we are also at a moment where everything is under discussion, everything is under consideration. So we have to be very careful on how we communicate this. So please understand anything that I'm saying now, as it's it's work under process. Nothing is approved yet, and everything can change until the last uh, until the last minute. Uh, so please uh, bear in me, and I, I wish in a way I could share more information, um, but unfortunately we have to play by the uh, by the rules. So um, just to put a little bit of a framework on on the discussion um, and where we are right now, of course um, you all know building sector is the largest energy consumer in Europe. It represents 40% um, of energy consumptions. I don't think I'm saying anything new today. Um, but I do need to highlight the importance of the um, of the existing sector, um, where we have very low renovation rates, where the large majority of the building stock is energy inefficiency, and even a larger uh, percentage of these building stock will still be in use in 2000, by 2050. So if we want to make sure that we have a decarbonized building stock by 2050, and if we want to make sure that we comply with all the uh, climate and energy objectives by 2030, we need to touch upon the, uh, the existing building stock. And that's why um, we launched last year the, uh, the renovation wave. The objective is very simple. It's double the renovation rates and to make sure that these renovations lead to higher energy and resource efficiency uh, of buildings. Important to highlight here, um, because I'm going to be talking pretty much from now on exclusively about the EPBD, but it is very important to understand that um, the renovation wave is not just the EPBD. There are a number of other legislative documents um, or frameworks involved, like the EED and the REST Directive. It also touches upon other areas like sustainability and climate resilience. So um, it's much broader. It's about making sure that our buildings are ready for the future. It's not just about um, energy, although I would argue that probably energy is the most important factor, at least at least for us. Um, so where we are now uh, with the revision of the uh, Energy Performance Buildings Directive? Well. Um, it's very much focused on provisions that are central to boosting building renovation. That's that's the, the main focus, and that's where we started. But of course, we are also looking at uh, how can we make sure that new buildings are ready for the future too. So the roadmap, which we published in January, it's now closed. The open public consultation, which we published in, in March and it was open until June, it's now closed. We uh, gathered uh, the input for these, uh, these, uh, from this open public consultation. We integrated in, in all our internal discussions. And of course, we made use of it during our, uh, our impact assessment. 
In parallel to that, um, we carried out stakeholder engagements. We organized a series of workshops with stakeholders between uh, the, the first half of the year. And I would argue that this engagement continues now. That's why I put it, uh, we're still in, in Q3, uh, because we're still discussing with stakeholders at this stage. We're still organizing uh, uh, meetings sometimes. We're still meeting with people. Um, so it's th we're still in, in listening mode and we'll probably be in listening mode until the very, very end. And finally, also very important to highlight, the Commission proposal is still set uh, for Q4 2021. We are still uh, on target to publish, an, sorry, to adopt the uh, proposal by the end of, uh, of December. I mentioned this because I heard rumors, uh, people saying that it's going to be delayed. Um, certainly, that's not the message that I'm getting from my hierarchy. Um, we, we have to submit by the end of the year. So um, if nothing happens, we're still on time. So now on the policy measures and the consideration and goals and, and a big stress on the issue that everything is under, under consideration. So it's not just that the, these individual elements are under discussion, but also the, the provisions within and how we set up each one of these elements are still under discussions. So perhaps the, one of the most visible ones is, uh, is the new energy performance standards. This is a new instrument to be introduced. There are several design options possible, but the main objective is to make sure that we tackle the worst energy performance standards. Uh, sorry, the, the worst energy performance uh, building stock. It builds on existing initiatives in, in, in some member states. So we, we take lessons from them and we try to apply them in all, uh, in all member states. The other element is a, a new definition for deep renovation. Um, we revisit the 60% energy savings. Uh, this, reno this definition is very important uh, because of any possible links with uh, finance. So it's not an obligation to renovate up to this level. It's more um, a definition that can be used by, um, by uh, financial institutions, for example. Um, the building renovation passport is a tool that has been under discussions for quite some time, so we really want to, to try and implement it as much as possible. The key focus is it's an instrument to help the renovation of buildings on a step-by-step -step manner. And the important element is that it also needs to be linked with other instruments, particularly, for example, financial instruments. Uh, on energy performance certificates, which I think it's the, the big topic today, at least in this, uh, in this meeting, there are a number of measures. It's quite, it's quite a substantial revision here that we're looking at. Um, first of all, we want to improve the quality and comparability of EPCs, so a bit of a harmonization um, exercise. And, and also, it's not just a matter of improving the quality of the EPCs, but also improving the perception of, EP, of quality, um, which uh, you may have a very good system, but sometimes the perception out there is that it's it's not good. So we need to improve on both elements. Uh, the other element is um, the imp improve the accessibility for users. So, for example, by using uh, EPC databases and make sure that these databases can uh, can be accessible by users um, and can publish uh, aggregated and uh, and anonymized information about EPCs. And then improve the information role of EPCs by enlarging the set of information provided. So not just the um, not just a purely indicator on, on energy performance, but also which other uh, elements, what other uh, indicators are very relevant for the uh, for the EPC and for people to encourage them and to give them ideas on how they can carry out the um, the renovations. On uh, decarbonization of buildings, we currently have um, nearly zero energy buildings. So we're looking on how can we strengthen these to make sure that we also take into account the, uh, the carbon element. Um, and we're also looking on how we can introduce greenhouse gases metrics in, in EPCs. Uh, on smart readiness indicator, we're looking on measures to accelerate the, the next steps and create particularly synergies with, uh, with other tools. Um, at the moment, as you may know, we are on the testing phase of the SRI, so we want to make sure that this is as successful as possible. And uh, finally, on electromobility, um, we are looking at how we can strengthen the requirements for recharging. At the moment, we have minimum charging points and minimum uh, infrastructure for, um, for charging points. So it's it's looking forward can we can improve this type of uh, this type of requirement and particular consideration to e-bikes and e-scooters and other uh, electric vehicles uh, the overall goals is of course increase renovation uh, rate and depth we want to enable the decarbonization of buildings and we also need to accelerate the modernization of buildings and of their systems um one thing that I wanted to highlight is the um, the link of the EPC with uh, a number of initiatives, and particularly um, with the taxonomy. 
actually, if I just go back to the to the previous slide, um, I would like to point out that, for example, minimum monthly performance standard that uses the EPC as an indicator, the deep renovation standards that would use the EPC or that could use the EPC as a as a means of measuring the improvement, the building renovations passports would need to be linked to the EPC. Of course, EPCs are linked with EPCs. <laughs> Uh, and then, for example, also the smart renovation indicator could be very strongly linked to the EPC. So the EPC has a has a strong central uh, role in it, and that is also reflected in the different um, elements within the taxonomy. So as um, as you may know, um, the taxonomy um, sets uh, to define what is considered as a sustainable uh, investment. Um, it uses and it builds on uh, relevant EU legislation on buildings, particularly on the uh, on the EPPD. Um, but in practice, it also needs to be very flexible and provide alternatives when um, when a specific element is not present. Um, in buildings, it's mostly there to set the ambitions and means of checking uh, these ambitions. So we make uh, strong reference to these energy buildings, EPCs, and uh, the labeling of products. Just to provide um, a few examples, sorry, I, I went a bit too fast. Um, for example, new buildings need to be 10% better than NZEPs. That's checked with an EPC. Uh, the building renovations, uh, it, in order to be considered a building renovation, it needs to be at least a 30% improvement in primary energy demand to be demonstrated with an EPC. Um, in, in terms of installation and repair and maintenance, uh, they need to comply with minimum energy performance requirements and, and also with, um, sorry, they need to comply with minimum energy performance requirements and product legislation. This can be demonstrated, for example, with an EPC. And similar transpositions, uh, sorry, similar provisions affect, for example, um, the installation and repair of charging stations, the installation and repair of uh, building automation and control systems and metering and installation and repair of renewable energy technologies. All, all these elements, we're looking on how can we make sure that there is an easy tool to access like the EPC that can provide um, demonstration for uh, a proof um, of, um, of performance for all these uh, for all these elements. And uh, finally, one that is quite relevant because the other ones are very specific when something happens in the building. This is very specific when the building changes hands or um, but basically it affects the real estate market, um, which is, uh, quite an important one. So, um, for buildings uh, there are, that are built after 2020, there are clear links with uh, with NZEPs for older buildings. There are clear links with EPC classes. Um, for larger buildings, also we need to demonstrate that they have uh, the building automation and control systems that are required as part of the EPPD. And for all of these elements, it is possible to use the, EP, the EPC. Basically, what I'm trying to say with all of this is that um, we expect the EPC to have a very important role in the coming years. It's a, it's it's not an important piece on its own, but it also links to another uh, a large number of other provisions in the uh, in the EPBD and in uh, in other pieces of legislation. So this puts even more pressure on making sure that we get EPCs right. Uh, not just in terms of quality, but also in terms of uh, making sure that we can adapt, for example, to future technologies. So, um, and how we can compare them uh, also between member states, for example, how we can harmonize them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so for that, I'm very interested to know um, about what's going to be discussed in today's uh, session. And I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, for your presentation. Uh, I think I, we fully understand that uh, it's really uh, tough for you to uh, present uh, uh, the state of uh, the discussions. Uh, you are in the middle of a, the middle of a work uh, to present it, but thank you very much that uh, that you gave us uh, an overview of what is uh, under construction now, and uh, it's uh, really important for us to have your vision. And uh, I think it's important also to share a different visible vision from other stakeholders today. So a great thank you to you. And I give uh, the floor now to Marianne Jolie Fabri. Uh, she's the head of research from BPI E. And please, uh, Marianne Jolie, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me just put the timer so that I use the time minutes that I have. So thank you for, for the invitation and, and thank you, Paul, for, for your presentation. 
Um, I would also um, want to give you a bit of a, a, an overview of what VPIE uh, see uh, the role of, uh, of the energy performance certificates is in uh, not only in the revision of the PPD, but in the overall um, role of buildings that buildings have uh, in, the, in, the EU, uh, in the EU target. So we know that by 2050, the building stock must be net zero energy and carbon over the whole life cycle. We do have um, a slightly more demanding position than the, the European Commission on what is the expected um, um, rate uh, for deep renovation that we should achieve by 2030. It's not uh, doubling, but it's really having tripling, basically, having a, at least a 3% deep renovation rate by 2030 and a reduction of 60% of greenhouse gas emission for the building sector. Um, Obviously, um, the entire sector uh, has to contribute to the achievement of this target, and the EPBD is really at a milestone at a corner store for achieving um, and reaching climate neutrality. I was very happy to hear what are the areas and the topics that the European Commission is, um, is considering it um, uh, to make the EPBD fit for, 20, for 2030. We have identified four main, four main blocks. Um, uh, a clarified and more ambitious um, vision for the building stock with the integration of the whole life carbon consideration, standards and tools to make um, uh, to really achieve climate neutrality for all buildings, and an ecosystem of transformative policies and measures. And I think um, Frank, you also mentioned that really to make sure that there is a systemic uh, change. Uh, to make sure that we actually achieve the decarbonization of the whole building stock and also um, making buildings uh, uh, for people and making sure that everyone is on board with the, um, with the renovation wave. What is the role of the energy performance certificates in all of this? Um, you, um, you see a very short uh, summary of what, uh, of what we consider uh, the main uh, um, areas and the mere topics where the EPCs re really have, have a role. Um, I will go a bit more in detail in my next, uh, in my next slides with, the, with some recommendations, but it's really, as it has already been mentioned, increasing the quality of the energy performance certificate, not only in terms of their look and their um, comparability, but really on how and they can be used and their, their role and the objective. Um, in the uh, in the decarbonization of the building stock, make sure that the EPC really become useful and usable tools uh, for uh, the users, and they are really accompanied with very specific recommendations uh, on how the buildings can be improved. So moving from just being a picture of a moment in time of the status of the building to an instrument that can also start triggering thoughts and actions for, towards, a, uh, towards a deep renovation, linking it with other instruments. Both have already also been mentioned by, by Paul. So the, the smart readiness indica indicator, the uh, building renovation passport and the digital logbooks, expanding the scope of uh, the EPCs and developing and linking them to really a network of advisory uh, services where um, the building owners and tenants can can find then this, the the support uh, that they need to make sure that they can um, achieve um, um, they can plan for the renovation and they can actually achieve the renovation that they want within the time and the budget and the savings that are expected. In terms of practical recommendations, we have. Um, uh, identified um, a few main uh, uh, main headlines under which there are some elements that we think can be um, can and should be addressed uh, in the EPBD, and this is based on the result of research that we've done in the past, and some of the projects that are actually also uh, present today uh, are projects where BBIE is, is a partner, so I will not go too much into details about this. Um, but really, the EPCs have this challenge need to fulfill new purposes and building to, uh, to a, a other measures that will be introduced uh, um, in the future, be them uh, minimal performance standards, building renovation passport, logbooks, or financing measures. 
it is absolutely essential that there are some key quality principles uh, to make sure that um, the EPCs achieve a certain level of quality across all member states and uh, a, a certain level of um, trustfulness uh, and ability to be compared. So, because they are of different use for different for different people, we tend to think of the EPC as just useful for the end users, like the owner and the tenants, but they also actually have many other potential users, including decision makers, including researchers, and it's important that they are um, lifted to that point. So there are four main um, headlines, the data gathering and managing, so really make the, the way uh, the data uh, is collected, stored, processed, shared and accessed. Um, making sure that there are easily um, easy to access databases in all member states and that there, the EPC database is connected with other existing databases that can be used for planning, renovation and benchmarking. The methodology and indicators really making sure that there is a clear harmonization and improvement on the calculation methodologies and had uh, addition of new indicators um, uh, like uh, measure performance or actually per actual performance in uh, indoor um, air quality and indoor environmental quality, for example, and quality checks of the methodologies and, and, and software. This is essential to make sure that that uh, trust in, uh, in the instrument um, and also that perception of trust that Paul was mentioning before would be, uh, would be addressed. The other two uh, uh, last point are the design and readability, so making sure that um, the EPCs uh, contain all this information, but in a way that is really readable and attractive uh, for uh, the user, but also that secure the rel reliability and the quality and including in particular for the part that uh, pertain to specific recommendations for renovations and upgrade which today were existing is quite general and not necessarily of easy comprehension and understanding for uh, for the building owners and the tenants and the uh, the last point uh, uh the last headline is about monitoring implementation um, it really covers uh, a number of, of elements, including how uh, the uh, EPCs are um, released, um, by whom. So uh, there's the need to make sure that there are skilled certifiers that actually um, deliver the EPCs, ideally based on uh, a performance assessed uh, on-site audit, um, making sure that there are um, auditors that and certifiers that are properly trained and upskilled when it's necessary, that these training are updated when there are major changes, and also um, including uh, increased ex quality quality control, controls and stringent penalties for those who actually do not follow uh, uh, the, uh, the standards and they do not deliver um, quality or or uh, or truthful uh, energy performance certificates. This is really just um, a short overview of all the different changes that uh, could be made to the EPCs, but I would um, actually leave the room to, uh, to the panelists to make sure that um, they uh, have the opportunity to share with us how the project that they worked on and they're working on can contribute are contributing to that debate and can contribute to uh, to this debate. So I will switch my role now. I'm uh, from presenter to uh, panel uh, moderator. Um, thank you, Frank, for um, um, moderating the first part of this um, of this debate. And uh, I do have one question, which is the same. It's the first round of question for all the panelists. Um, I will call upon you uh, uh, to, to reply. Um, and, um, and then I will have some uh, few follow-up um, questions. So the first question that I would like to ask every panelist is um, the following one. What is the most relevant contribution that your project, as you see it, is bringing to the, the conversation that we just had about the revision of the EPVD. Sorry, that was my timer. 
to make sure that the energy performance certificates really become an actionable instrument uh, for the deep renovation of the EU building stock. Um, my colleague Roberta will keep the timer. You, you do have uh, a couple of minutes each to answer this question. Please stick within time because we are numerous and we would want to make sure that then we have a number of follow-up questions. So I would start with uh, Stefan from uh, uh, Quality EPC. And please switch on your camera. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Maria Angela. Um, yeah, Stefan Thomas from the Wuppertal Institute. I'm coordinating the Quality PC project. And uh, um, this project uh, especially focuses on uh, the link between uh, and the usefulness of uh, EPCs and uh, deep renovation. Um, so, yeah, um, I was. Uh, uh, it was good to see, to hear from uh, Paul Garcia that uh, um, there will be a new standard for deep renovation. We had to invent one uh, for ourselves. <laughs> um, and um, uh, our main contribution is on one hand, um, uh, a set of uh, rec uh, recommendations that are in line with uh, deep renovation. So in order to improve the renovations that are uh, on the EPCs, and also, we um, uh, propose a, a revised uh, template um, for the uh, EPC itself, which is more user-friendly, um, has the, the main information uh, noted in a user-friendly way, and has more information on uh, than it is, has currently in most countries, um, built uh, on some best practice in, in our seven countries um, about um, uh, the um, energy performance uh, level that can be achieved after implementing the set of recommendations um, um, and uh, a traffic light system that uh, classifies the efficiency of components both in the current stand, uh, status of the building uh, and uh, for the uh, renovation recommendations which, which normally should be uh, green uh, in this traffic light system and also some information about how to combine um, uh, in uh, uh, the uh, in a in a roadmap um, the renovation recommendations. Um, so as a kind of a first step towards an, uh, a building renovation passport, and also a link to an information platform, a comprehensive information platform, um, and an online tool um, for the uh, user to calculate him or herself the effect of the uh, recommendations that are given on the EPC. Thank you. Andre, from USERT, what is the contribution that your project can give to, uh, to the view of the EPC, of the EPC, yes, in the framework of the EPD? Yes, thank you, Marangela. Apologies, I have some issues with the camera, so you'll only hear me. Um, so I represent USERT. Uh, U stands for uh, user uh, centered. Uh, well, actually, we discovered we conducted a, an ethnographical uh, research. So talking to people, it should have been people centered, <laughs> to be uh, correct. Um, and we talked to people at very different levels uh, uh, in the value chain of EPCs. And uh, we see that they see the potential of EPCs. Um, however, for the time being, uh, they, they find it in a way, uh, they, some of them said it's, it's cheap, but it's not cost effective, meaning that it provides some information, however, not uh, contextualized enough for their day-to-day -day activities or for making a difference in their decision-making process. So that's one aspect, and it actually builds on the other elements uh, that we are looking at in USERT. And I'll just say three key words, uh, the set of EPB standards, uh, the smart readiness indicator, and operational rating next to the, let's say, uh, acknowledged and well-used asset rating. Uh, on the set of EPB standards, um, USERT is providing support on the decision-making process to reach, uh, to, to, let's say, converge, to go towards this harmonization in terms of uh, building calculation, building performance calculation methodology. Um, and it provides a set of uh, reports and we will also have a digital tool uh, to help the decision makers uh, understand how they can leverage uh, the set of EPB standards and it will be a web-based uh, tool that can 
uh, easily show the impact of different choices when it comes to the actual uh, calculation methodology. And this has a big impact, of course, uh, on quality. And as we all know, building physics uh, is the same worldwide. Uh, so technically, there should be just one calculation methodology for building performance. Uh, however, for uh, meeting the, the asks from the people to make them more cost effective, even if they would be at a higher cost than they are today, uh, the smart readiness indicator uh, presents a huge opportunity uh, because it can outline the additional functionalities a building should have uh, to go towards operational rating, uh, which uh, again in turn uh, would add on the quality because asset rating is something uh, needed. You cannot say we don't need it anymore and we just go to operational rating. So based on measure data, you need asset rating, especially when you have a new construction, but in general, However, you need to correct it with measure data, and that would bring everything closer to the day-to-day -day activities and yeah, the reality we all live in, and that basically would make EPCs an action actionable tool that provides contextual-based uh, information. And also for these elements, uh, we are preparing uh, additional digital tools uh, uh, via web browser accessible where the different, uh, let's say, people that could access the, this information, being the tenants, owners, uh, researchers, financial institutions, policymakers, could actually see what's happening on the ground. Uh, and of course, you could still keep the same uh, approach once in a while. You have like a snapshot, like the EPCs you have today. But uh, people say that uh, it's not enough, the energy. It needs to have in next to it the indoor environmental quality, of course, the smartness, which enables many other things, um, and also the environmental impact. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Ina from Extendon, please stick to two minutes. I will just put a timer so that. Go ahead. Yes. So, I um, Extend stands for extending the energy performance assessment and certification schemes via modular approach. So the main contribution or an objective of our project is to support um, public authorities to implement and manage, organize their next EPC, uh, EPC schemes. Um, and the main contribution of our project is uh, the development of 10 features, 10 methodologies for the features. So uh, we see that uh, besides or together with these methodologies, we have see, we see as contribution for the project first the end user surveys that helped us to get insights not only which features can be uh, more appropriate in or could be more interesting for for implementation but also take into the account the different countries so in each features and which countries we did the service of with more of 500 500 people in five different countries, Poland, Portugal, Greece, Romania, and Denmark. So it helped us to understand the end user needs. Then besides, and together with the methodologies, which we are developing and will be also available in our toolbox, we also understand during the testing which uh, feature could be more interesting for different for the different implementing partners. So for example, we have the uh, the financing schemes, which is now very becoming more, I would say, more important and getting more, especially because of the EU taxonomy, taxonomy. We have also features that are very developed in very specific or very country specific, for example, as the outdoor air pollution. So I think Extendo gives this overview of the methodologies and also with uh, in the country specific uh, importance. Thank you very much, Ina. We'll move to the next project. Panajota, could you please, uh, is uh, D for EPC? I'm not sure how to pronounce it <laughs> correctly. Uh, you're right, we realized uh, after the project was accepted <laughs> that it's a difficult acronym to pronounce. Uh, we are also trying uh, ourselves there. It's a D square EPC actually. It's a dynamic digital EPCs for uh, uh, enhanced uh, uh, user awareness and performance uh and quality so uh our our project uh is um uh aims to introduce uh, um 
with new uh, and EU wide uh, deployment uh, with an EU wide deployment DPC uh, that will allow the regular um, assessment uh, of the building. We are utilizing uh, smart meters and uh, digital twins for the operational rating of the building along with uh, the, the asset uh, uh, classification based on the PBT standards. Uh, so, this uh, BIM based approach, I would say. Uh, could eliminate some uh, um, mistakes, uh, reduce time and automate the process so we have enhanced quality as well. Uh, and um, uh, one other aspect of uh, D2PC is the provision of additional indicators. We have a multi-parameter assessment that uh, includes aspects relevant to smart readiness indicator, uh, human comfort and well-being, um, sustainability and uh, financial also indicators. Uh, all of these uh, new aspects uh, give a better understanding of the uh, of the performance uh, of the building to end users. Uh, and um, we also want to extend our applications uh, from uh, the certification to uh, additional services uh, like uh, using AI tools. Um, we have the provision of uh, recommendations uh, for uh, customized recommendations for performance and grades. Uh, we have the provision of uh, forecasting for optimizing the building use uh, according to uh, the needs of the building uh, user. And uh, also another tool for um, alerting and notifying the user um, uh, whether his performance may influence uh, the uh the performance of the building uh, and uh, could uh, re um, could end up to a performance downgraded uh, of the um, of the epc um our epcs will also have um I stop you there because your, your time is up but i've I got a heavy timer also <laughs> I, was have a, the ring. I will have a i will have a follow-up question for you i see some um some commonalities across different projects that are looking at, at different things. So I think we are all uh, looking at the same uh, at the same direction. I wanted now to give uh, to give the opportunity to to Maria from Ipanasia. Thank, uh, thank you very much. To just let us know, to tell us what what does the project, um, what is its most essential contribution to the debate on the EPC and in, in ba on the basis of what we we just heard this morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Marian Girola. Uh, well, uh, IPANASIA uh, aims to overcome the current EPC challenges as uh, the rest of sister projects, of course, uh, of course, but uh, with a special focus on the performance gap between calculated and actual consumption patterns, uh, incorporation of user dimension of uh, end users and so on, and improvement of uh, clarity of the information provided by the EPC. With this uh, main objective, uh, IPANASEA uh, develops uh, an innovative, uh, holistic and flexible methodology uh, based on three different energy assessment methods and its decision matrix, covering technical building innovations and the use of actual uh, building data for energy model modeling. Uh, the whole IPANASEA methodology uh, will be integrated on an online platform so called the SEPA, Smart Energy Performance Assessment Platform. And uh, this platform will integrate uh, inverse modeling and automatic calibration procedures for dynamic uh, building energy simulation, obtaining very accurate models, but uh, reducing at the same time the computational cost and improving the cost effectiveness of the whole process. So in my view, the most relevant contributions of IPANACEA uh, to the ongoing EPD revision is on one hand the digitalization of the APC through the SEPA that at the same time uh, provides a common and digital framework for integration of other instruments, taking advantage of uh, synergy and complementary uh, from them. And on the other side, uh, calibrated and dynamic models uh, that reduce the performance gap uh, allow more accurate uh, energy assessment of energy efficiency measures, of course, with the improvement uh, of the market trust on the EPC regarding this issue. What, of course, in my point is a key aspect no, for supporting the deep renovation of the current uh, building stock. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Maria. Perfect timing. So I now ask the same question to Olivier from EPC Recast. 
Good morning and thank you for giving me the, the floor. So I'm Olivier Grelou from CSTB and coordinator of the Sirecast project. So the key objective of the project is to improve the reliability and quality of existing and next generation EPCs. So the, the core of the project is to define a harmonized European protocol that is practical and that is aimed at EPC assessors to improve their working practices, their daily practices and facilitate their work uh, on field. So this protocol is developed on the methodological side and then it's implemented in a digital toolbox with a set of digital services. It's uh, done in three steps. So the first step is to improve the data collection to better characterize uh, the building on site with uh, uh, services like a digital scan of the, of the building geometry and also connecting with uh, databases and with smart meters to infer information that can be used afterwards to calibrate the energy model. So the second step is to better calibrate the, the energy model of the EPC. We are doing that for several national calculation methods. We are not proposing a new calculation method uh, at EU scale. Uh, and then we are going to use this calibrated model to uh, define some renovation scenarios for the building and provide all the information in a revised EPC template that can display in a user-friendly way the information to, to building owners. So this building template uh, is based on the template we developed in the Alban project. Uh, EPC Recast focuses on the residential sector and we are trying to better integrate uh, information from the SRI to, uh, to show how the controls of the building can be improved through also renovation and improvement actions. Also IEQ information so that this EPC certificate could be used for funding uh, renovation projects. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, I now pass the floor to uh, Maria from CrossCert. Hello, good morning to everyone. Uh, Maria Rando from University of Zaragoza. We are coordinating CrossCert project. As the name says, uh, my contribution is cross-testing. So we aim to provide a cross-product uh, product testing methodology for the new EPC approaches that will result in improved accuracy and usability of uh, EPCs, people-centered designs, and also increased homogeneity uh, across Europe. We will perform this cross-testing exercise on more than 140 buildings. It is distributed in, distributed in 10 different uh, countries using both current EPC approaches as well as uh, new EPC approaches that are proposed by the current projects. The results of all these will uh, cross-testing exercise will give us uh, some basis uh, to elaborate policy recommendations, uh, which include potential improvements on accuracy, uh, uh, usability and harmonization. Uh, we will also develop a knowledge exchange center uh, to provide information and accessibility to users. And we hope that all of these uh, will help both end users and also policy makers uh, to understand better the information provided and containing EPCs and also to know where is the potential renovation uh, in their buildings and therefore to boost uh, this uh, building renovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, same question, we have the, the last three projects to, to answer this question and then I will go more into more of the specific. Um, uh, Peter from EU Superab, UB Superab. Hello, good day everyone. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you for the uh, question. Uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, EU Superhub uh, started in 2021, so the current uh, uh, process of the uh, recast of uh, the EPVD, uh, we obviously uh, won't make a significant input. Uh, but uh, from our consortium, uh, experts are um, uh, taking part in the in the technical working groups, uh, so they feed uh, with uh, ideas and expert advices uh, to the current process. Uh, probably that's the the most uh, direct uh, link uh, to the current process. EUB Superhub in general uh, is a European building uh, sustainability uh, performance and energy certification hub. It stands for and uh, as uh, the title suggests, uh, we try to uh, take uh, a closer look to uh, the, the life cycle approach, how you can uh, view the buildings 
uh, uh, holistically, so from, from the building life cycle, and that leads us to sustainability and some uh, those kind of uh, uh, indicators that are connected to health, comfort, uh, material use in the buildings. Uh, we will pretty much focus on, on that and the uh, the project will uh, uh, deliver a, a one-stop shop solution uh, where we test uh, technology and platforms how they can uh, serve this uh, idea uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Um, Alexander from IB Road to EPC. Hello and thank you very much for this invitation. I'm Alexander Deliganis from Simpraxis team coordinating the Ivy Road to EPC project, which uh, just started in September. Uh, our ambition is to enable EPCs to go beyond uh, a general call to action, to become uh, conducive to specific action and thus catalyze uh, the deep renovation uh, of the EU building stock. Now, if I take a simple example, uh, currently an EPC could tell me that my home is rated F or G, uh, but probably it can't give me very specific advice about what to do uh, about it beyond feeling desperate. So such guidance is badly needed and it needs to be provided along with the rating information. Uh, when you are navigating with a car, for example, you would use the same map to identify your position, uh, where you want to go, uh, then chart uh, your, your way and track your itinerary. Uh, both Pio and yourself, uh, mentioned already the building renovation passport as well as the digital building logbook and uh, how it could be linked to the EPC. So it's great to see that the current discussion includes uh, all these aspects. In IB Road to EPC, we are looking uh, into injecting uh, elements to take a you know a word that is is very common now, injecting elements of the building renovation passports into the EPCs of six uh, countries in Europe. Uh, test um, this approach, contribute to the greater uh, policy process in a very practical uh, manner. IB Road to EPC, I should say, is a follow-up to the IB Road project, which did uh, produce a specific model for the building renovation passport, and it is this model that we are adapting uh, for integrating into EPCs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. And now our last uh, panelist, Alvaro from TimePack. If it's pro pro <laughs> pronounced. Yeah, hello. Properly. Good morning. I am Abra Cecilia from La Salle Barcelona campus. We are coordinating the TimePack project. And the, um, the main contribution of TimePack uh, to this topic is to increase the quality and reliability of the EPC. And for us, this involves to use uh, BIM technologies, which is when it is feasible, using operational data when for the generation of the EPCs, and to improve the procedures for quality checking of the EPC databases. We are going to generate training materials and in different languages that will include tips and tools for quality checks of the EPC data. We will produce guidelines that will foster the generation of the EPC um, um, from BIM data. And also, uh, TimePack will contribute to use and a better use of the EPC databases. Uh, we have six countries and we are auditing uh, these databases, the EPC databases from technological point of view. And we want to understand if they can support or not the new EPC schemas and if they can be linked or not to other databases. So the final goal is to open these EPC databases following the FAIR principles to generate new services. And uh, in this topic also, uh, new uh, ma training materials will be generated uh, with recommendations uh, to link these EPC databases to external uh, databases such as BIM repositories, cadastres, construction product databases, and so on. And at the end, all of, all of these training materials will be accessible through the Time Pack Academy to policymakers, public authorities, and citizens and technicians in order to be used by them. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, it seems to me that the, the, the four um, main headlines that I used in my presentation could, uh, could be used to regroup some of this project and, and we would haven't um, left anyone out, um, probably. I would um, now like to go a bit into details and ask you um, uh, some, specific, uh, some specific questions. And I would start uh, from one that I think it's a very, uh, a very common um, question, and it's uh, and it's for for Panagiota from. Um, and the question is, 
whether should all buildings have an EPC and if so by when should they have an EPC because now a building gets an EPC under very specific conditions. Uh, hi. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, for me, the question is not uh, why why should or whether should all buildings have uh, have an EPC. It's like let's make all building users who are going to have uh, an uh, an EPC. So uh, it comes with uh, multiple benefits, and uh, it can be a scheme that uh, uh, with uh, the proposed improvements and uh, well, from what I hear, what uh, all projects and vision to to introduce. I would uh, strengthen the, the role of EPCs and also uh, motivate uh, energy conscious behavior, uh, energy performance upgrades of their buildings. Now, uh, EPCs are perceived more like an administrative burden for building users. They usually um, follow this approach when they want to construct a cell or a rent a house. Uh, they're not uh, familiar with uh, the benefits or the information that is provided within the EPCs. So let's make this information more, uh, more useful and more user-friendly. The addition of uh, indicators of multiple as aspects like the SRI, the sustainability, human comfort, um, will provide more awareness uh, to the users and also uh, on, on the cost of, uh, of the building use. Um, so I would say that it's uh, it's uh, of multiple benefits to have uh, EPCs for all uh, for all buildings that can allow also a, a more um, uh, documented decision making and uh, planning also on on a policy level uh, for uh, for the uh, approaches that we want to follow and to reach the the targets that we have now for energy efficiency and uh, uh, pollution reduction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, I, when I think about you know, uh, um, what you just said, or making sure that people want uh, an EPC, um, uh, the question is how can we make it and um, how can certain instruments uh, can contribute to that? I'm thinking in particular to, to the building uh, um, renovation passport and what could be the relations between the EPC and the building renovation passport. And this question is for, for Alexander, for my bureau to EPC and, and for, for, Tem, uh, for Stefan uh, Thomas. What do you think uh, could be the link and the support that these two instruments have? Because they both have a very strong, uh, um, information value in a way um, and to make it to become attractive uh, for for the users maybe stefan if you want to start um, thank you um, uh, indeed um, they are both information uh, instruments um, the uh, building renovation passport uh, as the name says uh, has its focus on the uh, renovation uh, whereas the epc as uh, mixed purposes, um, uh, it was always also meant to create awareness about uh, the energy consumption of the buildings and to, to make people value the, the energy efficiency. Um, but um, it needs improvement, um, and this is what, what we are working on in Quality PC, um, to make it really also useful as an information tool to, to uh, stimulate uh, energy efficient renovation. Um, and so um, I see links in two aspects, which is uh, both the process of creating the data for a building and especially the uh, recommendations and the quality of the recommendations that should uh, lead to deep renovation, which is often not the case in the current EPCs. Um, and um, uh, then also yeah, in the presentation of the data in, in both the documents. and. Um, yeah, if uh, we really give climate change and uh, deep renovation energy efficiency priority, um, my suggestion would be that rather every building should have a building renovation passport and uh, as soon as possible, if not by, uh, or at least uh, say, every building that was built before, um, at least uh, low energy buildings were the, the standard for new builds um, in, in the different member states. So. Um, if not by 2025, then a few years later, all, the, all of these older buildings should have such a building renovation passport. Um, and this should also be subsidized. For instance, in Germany, you get 80% of subsidy for such a, a, a passport. 
and it should be taken um, as the opportunity to create the, the high quality buildings data and, uh, and rec recommendations, which then can be used um, if also stored in, in, a, in a database um, uh, to create an EPC whenever an EPC is needed uh, for the, the building transitions, uh, transactions uh, like uh, uh, selling and renting. Um, and this EPC should then also, of course, have the information, at least the most important information about potential improvements in uh, energy efficiency and uh, uh, which rating could be achieved uh, after implementing these. And yeah, on cost effectiveness, for instance. So this, this would also overcome the, the problem of ensuring the EPC quality uh, when at the same time the EPC shouldn't cost so much uh, money. In my view. Thank you, Alexander. What is what is your view? Do you share what so, Stefan? First of all, I I fully share what what uh, Stefan said, and um, and I would build on it uh, in terms of um, of uh, first of all uh, the both uh, the EPC and the building renovation passport being an information instruments, and that information has to be reliable. Otherwise, it's not really information, it's misinformation. So the quality of the EPCs, uh, having for all buildings to have an EPC would, would be easy when we have uh, some EPCs costing 25 euros in Europe, uh, but that's not what we want. We want something which is conducive to action and actually helps the, the building owner. Um, in this sense, uh, if, we, if I take another example, cars for the moment, we are discussing, uh, you know, Euro 4, uh, no longer should be in, in European cities, Euro 5 possibly soon. Uh, why? Because there is, there is a constant improvement and they need a need to, to ensure quality of life. In buildings, it's not so easy. It's not, uh, you cannot retire buildings so easily because there are people living in there. So we have to improve them. In this respect, uh, the EPC tells us about statically that, you know, this is the situation, the energy situation of your building is not so good. There has to be their uh, information conducive to action. There are already what are called customized recommendations in EPCs in several European countries. However, this should be much more specific. And the building innovation passport is what, is what supplies uh, this information. So there's a very good opportunity to bring them uh, two together. Interestingly, the EPCs are also uh, sources of information because when we have reliable EPCs, and ideally reliable building renovation passport, that, is, that information can be fed into the databases that um, Stefan said, and at the policy level, uh, guide us by providing benchmarks and saying, okay, where can we aim? Is well, Where are the low hanging fruit? What can, can we achieve reasonably? And there to push the financing in such ways that we can have uh, the best uh, possible synergies. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, what you what you just said made me think about also um, other links that, e that about links that EPC can actually have also with other with other instruments. And this is a, a question for for two of the other panelists, for, for Maria from Ipanasea and Olivier from EPC Recast about how should the EPC or could they be linked with other policy instruments? You know, we just mentioned the, the building renovation passport, but the smart readiness indicator is one. Uh, minimum energy performance standards could be another one. Have you um, explored this in, in your project that is something that uh, you think is feasible? Maria? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Maria Lapu, for the, the question. Uh, okay, first of all, uh, as a common framework, I think uh, that it is recommended that all these instruments are accessible through a common digital tool. Like, for instance, no, the CEPAP, the online platform under development by Ipanasea project. But uh, indeed, the digitalization of information through the use of common databases uh, easily accessible through web platforms uh, that also allow implementing different assessment is a key aspect uh, to build a link between all these policy instruments. Uh, then we could establish a, a common use of uh, data sources for all of them, but ensuring also a common data format for information exchange between different platforms. Besides uh, going deeply to each instrument, uh, there are also uh, some specific technical aspects that should be uh, explored. For example, you know, EPC and SRI could support each other uh, in several aspects. For instance, 
uh, the catalog of services in the context of SRI can support recommendations uh, based on building automation and control systems uh, whose energy saving could be quantified through the energy assessment carried out by the EPC. Also, the use of the energy balance from the EPC could improve current default values within the SRI calculation. For example, a customizing weighting factors according to the climate zone and the building use. And uh, also future SRI developments could explore the link between the SRI score obtained and a quantitative uh, value for a building uh, energy saving uh, quantification. Um, besides, as a last comment from my side regarding this question for the case of the building renovation passport, uh, the renovation roadmap and each renovation step defined on it uh, should be linked to the EPC rating system uh, in order to support, of course, you know, the process uh, with an objective and quantitative uh, instrument. More or less, this is my view. Thank you very much, Maria. Olivier, what is your take on this? Yes, I fully agree with what Maria said, and especially with this topic of um, data format to ensure interoperability between the tools. Maybe the first thing I would like to share is that we are facing uh, the issue of having several layers of information about the building, where we want to have a minimum but sufficient set of information to inform decision making. So maybe first we have a kind of data framework, which uh, is the PVD and LevOps and in one way. But then what we need to do is to define harmonized data structures to organize these layers of details and of information to ensure uh, consistency and interoperability between the tools. This is why I think we maybe should work on defining minimum interoperability standards that could be done in a functional uh, way in the first place, uh, what is the information you want to find in these different tools, but then also from a digital point of view in terms of uh, digital standards to ensure the tools can work one with the other. Hence the idea of hiking data format for input and output files for these tools. Then I think we, are, we have a kind of data iceberg for the building uh, and so, uh, what is the tip of the iceberg is the EPC and the renovation passport. So, the very tip of the tip of the iceberg is the EPC, and it's a picture a snapshot at one time, and then the passport provides a little more information dynamically through time about the building. And now, how do we kind of optimize the cost of each of these tools? Because maybe we're going to collect information reports about the building and produce them for instance, if we want to uh, provide a renovation roadmap in a passport, we're going to do energy simulations. We will have simulation reports. And we should use this information if we want to issue an EPC afterwards so that the cost is not twice, that just uh, assessors and auditors conduct the work just one time. So there is really a need to study better the cost of each of these tools and to try to uh, optimize this cost and share this cost between the different tools by better managing information, reports, data in a single place. And this is where we think the digital logbook should be used and, and, and structured. So this is what we are going to try in the EPC Recast project because we have a digital platform where we are going to gather documentation, past technical documentation about the building to issue new reports and indicators for the EPC process and try to see if we can create better links like that with renovation roadmaps and passports. Thank you very much. Very much. Um, the next question that I'm that I'm um, asking it's uh, it's related to to what is beyond underwater beyond <laughs> the other part of the iceberg because I think there are also um, uh, a few of the of, of a few projects that are considering um, adding uh, features uh, to to the EPC, so really adding the information and uh, to what is already to what is already provided, and and so this question is is for Andre and uh, from yourself and from Maya from from Extendo about how how much do you think that the the mandatory side of the EPCs can can evolve um, compared to, to, to the status quo, um, especially if um, 
we think about adding features to it and 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 what could be the additional features that that you think should be should be featured um, and choose one or two i don't think we we can go through all the the different possibilities but i would be interested in in, in hearing your view on this so maya are you there yes can you hear me and see me yes now we can thank you yeah so uh first the one the one first point is about the epc being yeah mandatory i think the experience has shown that only only not only being uh, mandatory is sufficient it's also important that people accept it and use it and it sees an added value on it so it can really get uh, uh i would say brighter and more used and um with that in regard it's very, as mentioned before the costs are very significant uh, significant aspect because the epc has to be attractive so if we have lower rates because it's mandatory it should not be um and then if uh, we use it we consider it not to be uh, a, a point an, an aspect that the cost should not be a, a barrier for then getting being it a uh, reliable instrument and used by people so we have uh, this th this aspect of being making it attractive reliable but ex but at the same time cost attractive for the end users and in terms of uh, additional features i think that the features have to be yeah in line with the current scheme and uh, for example in extendo what we try to do in the in raised recommendations is to use um, epc data to tailor the recommendation as far as possible and we believe that for example additional instruments as the building renovation passport could then provide further information for the end user and leaving the and be complementary to the epc for example, or um, the um, I would say also the financing schemes are also features that try to provide more information for the end users, but also at the same time, due to the parts that the methodology is not so complex behind it, we should not add some additional costs. So this is also one feature that we believe for Extendo that would be interesting. Also, what we uh, exemplared in the feature of the uh, outer air pollution, it was also a feature that is very specific for the Poland case, but it also gives uh, good and reliable information about the air quality without having very increased um, uh, costs in terms of, of methodology. So. In general, I, I, it's difficult to pick up uh, all the features. It would not be fair in between 10, but I, I think it would be uh, these, these are the, the first that come up to, to my mind for this question. Thank you very much, Ina. Andre, what is your view on this about uh, uh, the mandatory element and the additional features that could be included in the, in the new, uh, in a revised EPC? Yeah, thank you, Maria Angela. Um, for for that to happen, I think uh, to include everything, we would need to change the name of it. It wouldn't be an energy performance certificate, but a building performance certificate. And uh, we've seen in USERT, uh, most of the people are even willing, as I said before, to pay more uh, to have an EPC that's relevant for their day-to-day -day activities. So this is also linked to what pa Panagiota said, that uh, it shouldn't be imposed, it should be sought for. And if we go in this path uh, of uh, expanding the scope of EPCs, of course, we could include indoor environmental quality, the smartness, which would lead to operational rating, which would then correct the asset rating and so on. However, there is a limit, uh, let's say, what the policy instruments can do. So what, what we see in USERT is that uh, the EPC could act as a sort of coherence framework, if you want, for all the other uh, policy instruments like the SRI, the digital building logbook, building renovation passports. And the main uh, aim should be there 
to collect data only once. So data should be inputted so only once. And this is the, let's say, digital transformation helping this process to become reality. It's not something, it's it's already feasible today to have such a, such a, a supporting a digital platform somewhere. And some of the projects are working on that. Uh, and then in turn, to make it, let's say, attractive, you can go further with add-on services. So you can have a, let's say, a limit where the mandatory part uh, stops. And then you could go with add-on services, which would, uh, in a way, bring the market together. Because if we compare, as Alexander has, uh, buildings with cars, for cars, it's much more easy to have an industrial process, to have uniformity, and you have all sorts of indicators and notifications, uh, key performance uh, indicators in the dashboard, and so on. Uh, and people like that. We like that. We, want, we like to be in control. So uh, if we go in this direction for buildings as well, uh, the EPCs could act as this coherence framework uh, to align the services on the market uh, to meet the diversity of the existing building stock. Because for new buildings, let's say it's not such a big challenge, but for the existing stock, it's really rich uh, in terms of uh, differences, uh, which is good, of course, uh, but it's harder to align. So if you have this coherence framework, that could make it easier and uh, lastly this uh, coherence framework uh, could also uh, let's say uh, step up uh, the ambition uh, of everything that can bring into reality all these additional features um, because people would access it easier and they would want it and basically it would become a life experience an ongoing process not just a snapshot you could have still the mandatory part which is at different moments uh, but the really added value these add-on services would bring value continuously and that would link building performance to practice Thank you Thank you very much. Um, I now have a, a, a question that um, For our last two uh, panelists um, uh, Maria from Cossack and Alvaro from, from Time Impact About the methodologies now we've 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 seen how much um, change can be brought to the EPCs and what would be the value of it but uh, behind the EPC there is a, a, a methodology uh, there are software there there are a number of things that have been set up and decided and and the question that I have is that whether you know, should all the EPC methodologies be the same and harmonized within Europe? To, to what extent do you think this is feasible? And, and, and what in particular is, is important to do uh, as a first step to make sure that we do achieve um, and, and we can integrate all the changes that have been, have been discussed and highlighted today? Maria? Yeah, uh, thank you. So, so yes, I, I believe this will be some uh, some uh, some common sense, right? Because uh, to achieve this homogeneity and harmonization that we've been talking about, that we need in Europe. Uh, but uh, I guess it will be very hard to have exactly the same methodology. But at least there should be some guidelines, uh, because then uh, this way we can uh, compare the different uh, results of the EPCs within the same different countries. And also very important now that we are talking about integrate these uh, EPCs with uh, with different other initiatives like the building innovation passports, uh, building logbooks. If we don't have uh, general guidelines of general methodology, then uh, you cannot integrate them, right? So I, on on the same, for example, on the calculation side, you need uh, some some basics so so the results uh, can be compared. So using the same assumptions, same starting points, whether a dynamic or a static calculation. So all of these, uh, let's say, basics, I think this would be there. And then also regarding information provided and the appearance of the EPCs, uh, they should be similar to facilitate this integration again with initiatives. Also the comparison, um, using the same units. Uh, sometimes in, in different countries, they choose different units, so it's a bit more complicated to to compare, I'm, I'm talking uh, more aside than the energy label that is the one that is common, but also the other information that is contained in the EPC. I believe that in different countries it's different, so I think we have we need some harmonization uh, in there. Thank you very much, Alvaro. Yeah, I, I fully agree with Maria. This harmonization we need it, but it will be very difficult and. Um, we assume that uh, we have to assume that every PC schema, the national PC schemas, 
has their own data structure, calculation methods, and also they use, they use the same concepts, the same terms, but they have different meanings. So this heterogeneity has to be addressed, and we think that can be addressed with the standard tools and methodologies. And in this context, semantic web technologies has been proven successfully to in other domains to capture a knowledge expert and also to, to foster or to improve the data integration process. And, and here we can see that we can have a data integration process. So um, in, in that project, um, we are going to generate an EPC ontology that all national, all, most of the national EPC schemas can be translated or linked into this ontology. So the core elements, as Maria said, the indicators, all the, how they, um, the, the EPC is shown to the end user, the calculation methodolo uh, methodologies behind should be harmonized using this ontology. And in the cases that there are elements that cannot be harmonized, then at least we will bring or we should provide uh, transformation procedures in order to be comparable among uh, member states. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do have one last follow-up question to this, and please um, just switch on your camera for those who want to uh, want to answer it. Because when I think about you know harmonizing the methodologies and changing the EPCs, I also think about then those who would actually have to learn how to use this new tool and how to interface, if I can use this this, this term, with uh, with the users. And uh, we know now that in member states there are different ways in which uh, EPCs are delivered that by different people with different um, certification that might be required or a specific um, training. Should we also envisage harmonizing the training for EPC certifiers and, and issuers across Europe, uh, or would that be some uh, guidelines? Uh, would that be enough? In view of all the changes, like, like let's imagine that we are in ideal view, world, and all the changes that we discussed together today are possible within the next few years. How would we make sure? that then this instrument is properly used and properly delivered. How do we train the trainer? I don't know if any of you has a, an opinion on this. If not, I will just pick and choose some that I think might have. If, if I may, Marangela, sorry, my camera doesn't work. Sure. Uh, very brief, very brief. So if EPCs would become this sort of coherence framework, of course, the training part uh, would not only lead to higher quality, but also uh, to the creation of a feedback loop. So you would have something at EU level where you would have, let's call, master trainers. And then at national level, you would have the uh, trained trainers, which would then deliver everything else in national language, because we still have, we are united in diversity in Europe. So we speak many languages. So English is not enough. And that in turn would bring a lot of feedback all the way up uh, to the decision-making process at EU level. And that's uh, something that somehow is missing today. Uh, and that would further improve uh, everything that needs to be improved as we go forward with uh, the evolution of EPCs. Thank you, Andre. Is there anyone else that have, um, have an opinion on this? I don't know, maybe... Um, Alexander, I know, and I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I know that in IB Road you did um, a, a training program to, to teach uh, uh, auditors uh, how to use the Building Renovation Passport. If you imagine in doing this for the EPCs or for IB Road to EPC in, a, in the future, how, how would you see that? Um, well, I would say first that the, the training is related to the information content of the EPC, the Building Renovation Passport, and whatever other, other tools we are using. So in this respect, uh, what we found out in IB Road is that it's possible to have a, a set of, uh, of data indicators that are common across the European Union, at least all the countries that we, we addressed. Uh, and then a subset which is uh, country specific. That that subset, of course, can be quite big uh, in certain cases. So that's one challenge uh, which I believe can be addressed. There was another challenge which I think is much more difficult to address. In that is 
what are the expectations at the national level? And that is, is definitely something that at the level of the con information content has to be uh, addressed in the long term. To give a very simple example, in, in Greece, in order to be an energy auditor, one has to be uh, an engineer. Uh, in Germany, in order to issue certain types of EPC, one can be a chimney spe uh, sweeper. And to, to be clear, I, I do not uh, in any way snob uh, chimney sweepers because I find that it's a very complicated technical job. But it's clear that the requirements uh, at the moment are very different in, in, from in one country to another. So in this respect, um, I think that we have to, to, to uh, uh, at least consider the levels of, um, uh, of expectations and what it is that we are trying to achieve. I, my, my impression is that also at the national level, one could have uh, ser several levels of, um, of certification of uh, auditors and other professionals working in these tools. Uh, for example, to be able to issue the, the, the energy rating part, one thing, but to, able, to be able to plan a long-term plan uh, as in a building renovation passport, a, a renovation roadmap, which has specific uh, steps and um, be able to avoid lock-in, uh, the lock-in effect when implementing uh, the various steps of the renovation along a long period of time, that would probably require uh, additional skills and uh, additional uh, training and background for one to, to be able to do it. Thank you very much and thank you Alexander for answering uh, a question that uh, I put you on the spot. You had an idea uh, about this. Um, now I want to thank all like, the panelists. I think Pao has also had the opportunity to hear many of your, of your thoughts and probably uh, taken some good notes as I did. Uh, I would now like uh, to pass the floor to Marie-Laure Fauque-Massé, who's going to um, give us our, uh, um, the, uh, the closing remarks for this event. And thank you very much for being here. And uh, I'll thank you, everyone, for, for your participation. Marie-Laure. Thank you, Marie-Angela. Uh, I hope you can hear me. OK. So thank you for your invitation to conclude this webinar. Um, my name is Marie Laure Falke Masser. I'm uh, representing the Vice President Energy Transition of Federel. So I'm currently working um, in the Paris Region Institute. Um, next slide. So, as it was said by the, the panelists, we face several types of problems, difficulties in accessing in accessing quantitative and qualitative data on energy. Um, there are not uh, a lot of methodological differences between countries, a problem of reliability of sources, uh, also the qualification of diagno diagnosticians, um, and we have, uh, we cannot also, EPC develop for different types of buildings, but not everywhere and it does not cover all buildings. Um, they said also that we need more user-friendly tools, an improvement of the quality of EPCs, also a need to improve the gap between um, actual and calculated data and accessibility. But I'm very confident that this 11 project uh, will contribute to, to, to address uh, all these problems. Um, I would like to, to say that to get a better view, we need actually, we need other tools. And I will take an example in France, not the first one, but the second one. Um, some municipalities, some regions have developed local observatories of condominiums, as we have a lot of condominiums in France. And um, uh, this, uh, the local observatory are working with the data of our national directory of condominiums, uh, which give data on the, the stock, on uh, the, some data on, of, of, on energy, but not so much. So it needed to be completed with the data of the regional energy and climate observatory. So I would like to, to encourage you to, to develop energy and climate observatories uh, which support energy transition by providing supporting 
uh, decision support tools. And this is the, the purpose of uh, the Euro project Energy Watch, uh, which gathers regional and local energy and climate observatory all over Europe. So the project aims at training local authorities and local stakeholders for the creation of observatories with zero access, collection of data, design, implementation, monitoring, assessment and data. All these issues uh, have been raised uh, by, the, by the panelists before. And I will conclude by the key recommendations of FEDERAN. Um, encourage national authorities to support regional energy observatories to improve the monitoring of energy data, facilitate access to local energy data, and also the access to the data on the building stock. Use regional observatories to create a sustainable built environment and ensuring that minimum energy performance standards are based on reliable information on building performance to territorial observatories. So I thank you very much for your attention and I give the floor to Maya Angela. Thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you, everyone. This is uh, this closes our our webinar. Thank you for your attention. I think um, participants will receive uh, the uh, the PowerPoints, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to uh, to them, and we'll try to answer it the best of our uh, possibility. Thank you. Have a good lunch, and uh, I'll see you at the next webinar. <laughs>